God and Bull Run. The Battle of Manassas, or Bull Run, as it's known, was the largest battle in the history of the United States up to that point. You recall, as we discussed yesterday, they were expecting a short, decisive battle. They didn't think it was going to be big and it would end the rebellion. But the Battle of Bull Run changed everybody's mind about both sides. They realized they're in for an interesting experience, a hard experience. The title of the battle, Bull Run, you'll notice it's Bull Run or Manassas. It's interesting in the Civil War you have these battles with two names. And the unions, Union soldiers named their battles differently than the Confederates did. The Union used uh, some of the terrain to name their battles. In the case of Bull Run, Bull Run was a creek that ran through that area. And they titled this battle after the creek of Bull Run. It was actually part of a river, but was a creek at this point. And it's just a trickling creek today. And the Confederates named their battles after a city or a railroad junction. In this case, it was Manassas Junction. So they called it the Battle of Manassas. It's interesting that Ellen White, a northerner, referred to it in her writings, as I will share with you this morning. She referred to it as the Battle of Manassas, the disastrous Battle of Manassas. So those names were evidently exchange, interchanged between the different groups. But that's generally how they named it. So whichever you choose, it's Bull Run or Manassas. The largest battle in American history up to this point. Our interest in the battle is divine intervention. Ellen White described an angel coming down and impacting the course of the battle at the, the height of the battle in the afternoon. She saw an angel come down and wave the northern troops back and that changed the course of this particular battle. It's most fascinating for us Seventh-day Adventists. It has great spiritual truth. For one thing, it shows God's intervention in human affairs. And it also teaches us that at the very outset of the Civil War, God was very much involved in the battles. So we want to look at this story today. To start with, I want to give you the background to the battle. The Confederacy had transferred its seat of government from Montgomery, Alabama. Remember we discussed yesterday the founding of the Confederacy at Montgomery, Alabama. They eventually moved to Richmond, Virginia. So then you had Washington versus Richmond. And the pressure on Lincoln was go get Richmond. And they aren't that far apart. So this made things very interesting. Both sides sought to mobilize men and resources and plot military strategies. I mentioned yesterday that Lincoln didn't have much military experience. He had been in some small battles a long time ago, but he, he wasn't really uh, prepared to command a large military force. But Lincoln learned fast. He talked a lot with his generals, they gave him books to read. Lincoln read those books, and within the first year of the Civil War, Lincoln learned the basic strategy that he felt would win the war, and he became a great military president, as we all know. So both sides sought to mobilize men and resources and plot military strategies. The North had to mount an active campaign to force the Confederate States back into the Union. It was mainly the North who had to take action. The Confederacy had the earlier, or excuse me, easier task of countering the North's moves. All they needed to do was just sit and wait, and if Lincoln did not invade, the Confederacy would win by default. Now there's been a myth that has circulated in ver various places over the years about the Civil War, and that is that the North could have easily won. With one tie, hand tied behind its back, the North could have won. And if it got into trouble, it could have pulled the other hand out. And historians have shown that that's really not the case. 
Either side could have won. Without question, the North had some distinctive advantages over the Confederacy, but I want to share with you some of the advantages that both sides had here uh, as we get into this battle because this is crucial for the, the feelings about this battle and especially how the North felt in the aftermath. The North had some distinctive advantages over the South. More manpower for one, basically five to two in battle. The North had 22.5 million and, and the South had 9.1 million. It had the stronger economy. The South was a weaker economy. Therefore, the North could manufacture much more weaponry than the South. The North began the war with a professional army. It wasn't that large of an army. It was about 15,000 spread across the nation. But the South had nothing. They had to start from scratch. And they did a pretty good job of building a force, but the North had won over them in this matter. The South had some advantages, too, that made them difficult for the North to beat. They only had to defend, the Confederacy only had to defend itself to win independence. As I said before, it, it would have won by default uh, if the North had not invaded. And so they just had to wait, and when the North attacked, they were entrenched and ready to defend themselves. And that's pretty much what happened at Manassas. Defending home ground often exhibits greater motivation than an invader. For the South, while yes, as I said yesterday, they were in general defending their way of life, their institutions, slavery and so forth, at the same time they felt a sense of identity with their country and they were protecting their own and their motivation was very strong. That's still in the South today. I mean it's obviously in the North as well, but, but I know in the South when it comes to volunteering for the battle against terrorism, they are right on top of it. That goes back to the Civil War. Defending home ground often exhibits greater motivation than the invading force. Geography. The South had a very distinctive, huge, if you will, advantage over the North in terms of geography. The sheer size of the Confederacy, 750,000 square miles with 3,500 miles of coastline, this was a major challenge for the North in terms of invasion. And the Confederacy knew the terrain and the roads much better than the Northerners, and you see this throughout the, the war years. The Shenandoah Valley, the Appalachian Mountains provided coverage for the Confederacy in, in strategizing battles and so forth, and, and they knew where the roads were, and as the North went down into the south, they often found the worst roads and had trouble advancing their armies. And the south knew where the best roads were. So they knew the terrain, and that was a distinctive advantage. And you can see that in various battles. So either side could have won. A lot was at stake in this war. A lot was at stake in the first battle of Bull Run or Manassas. So let's look at the battle itself. Of course, we want to get the context so we understand Ellen White's vision properly. Winfred Scott, I mentioned him yesterday. He was the, a great American war hero by the time of the Civil War. He was old. He had, been, he had fought in the War of 1812. He was a great war hero in the war with Mexico, decorated soldier. And Lincoln turned to him for strategy in defeating the rebellion in the South. And Winfield Scott advised a carefully executed strategy that would take several years in invading the South. He described an entire program of blockading their ports and strategic invasions of cities. The news media called it the Anaconda, Anaconda plan that would constrict and choke the Confederacy. And it really was a brilliant plan, and uh, Lincoln and others were not in favor of it because it would take years. In fact, Scott, along with Ellen White, was one of the only ones saying this is going to be a long, hard battle. Ellen White wasn't the only one saying that, as I mentioned yesterday. Winford, Winfield Scott was saying that as well. And Lincoln was not really happy about this strategy because it would take too long, and he was un, under great pressure to make this a quick, decisive 
war. Get it over with quickly. But Scott said it's going to take years. And in the long run, Winfield Scott was right. It did take years. Lincoln was under pressure to make it a quick and decisive blow to end the war, as I said. Manassas Junction had attracted the attention of military strategists in both the North and the South. This was a strategic location. The Confederacy had already embedded itself there. This was the place to strike. Lincoln thus sent his forces under the leadership of General Irvin McDowell, 35,000 men to Manassas, backed up with Robert Patterson's 18,000 men. McDowell had taught classes on military strategy and been involved in some battle, but he never had commanded an army this large and never brought an army of that magnitude into battle. So he was green. His troops were green. And it was a risk. And Patterson was there backing up McDowell. But McDowell was a good strategist, however, and he had a great plan on paper. And if his troops had been more experienced, it may have worked well. And in fact, it did work well at the beginning. The Confederacy had Gustav T. Beauregard and Joseph E. Johnston heading their forces. So the first large military campaign of the Civil War pitted four forces, two Confederate uh, groups of soldiers and two Union against one another in Manassas, Virginia. It began on July 21, 1861. It was a hot July day. I was at Manassas a couple of years ago for the 150-year celebration. I'll say more about that in a little bit. And it was a hot day. The rangers were telling people, don't go out and hike too far. But I'm from the south. I grew up in Alabama where it gets really hot and humid. So I just took off out there and sweat, but I was fine. But I, I'm going to tell you, it was hot. It can get very hot in Manassas, Virginia. And that's how it was on July 21, 1861. McDowell planned to flank the Confederate forces on the left. Flanking maneuver... Uh, they, they used Napoleonic, Napoleonic strategies that they had learned at West Point, and the tendency was to avoid a direct attack and flank in set, instead. Interestingly, Beauregard had planned to flank as well. These flanking maneuvers would change in the course of the battle, reacting to various events. But that was the plan initially. Things went well, and I can only get to the highlight of the battle it uh, began early that morning of July and went up until about 5 o'clock. So it was an all-day battle. So I can just only hit the highlights here and build up for the part where Ellen White's vision comes into play. Things went well for the Union in the early hours, and McDowell stated, the day is ours. They, they apparently drove the Confederates back. This is on the three basic hills, Matthews Hill, Henry's Hill, and Chin Ridge. And Matthews Hill was about a mile from Henry's Hill, and that's where this initial battle took place. And McDowell seemed to be in charge. He seemed to have the day. In fact, he went riding up and down his forces claiming victory. The day is ours. But then he hesitated. He regrouped. Some strategists say he had good reasons to do that, but looking back on it, it was a terrible mistake. For a couple of hours, he regrouped. The reason why that was the mistake is because the Confederacy had time to reinforce themselves. Beauregard and Johnston had a great advantage over their federal opponents here because they have a rail link. That's the Manassas Junction. The Manassas Gap Railroad connected their two forces, which meant they could transport troops to the battlefield. And this had never been done before. And so they were able to reinforce themselves with fresh troops, which made all the difference in the world. One of those reinforcements was the Virginia Brigade, commanded by Thomas J. Jackson. And if you know anything about the Battle of Manassas, that's where Jackson became famous. Jackson had served with distinction in the Mexican War and taught military science at the Virginia Military Institute. He was a fascinating character, one of the, the most talked about characters of the Civil War. 
died early on in the, in the war, but made a significant impact, probably was the best general of the Confederacy. He became Lee's right-hand man before he was killed and made a significant contribution. It was the most famous general. He was eccentric and very religious. In fact, he had lost his wife and he felt he needed to be rigid and he always sat up in his saddle. And they say in battle, he had fought in Mexico war, and they say in battle his eyes glowed. This man loved battle, and he was good, and he was an excellent commanding general. And Jackson and his Virginians made a strong stand on Henry Hill. And I'm just hitting some of the high points of the battle here. But there's a story about Jackson, and this is where he became famous. South Carolina, this is the midst of the battle when he and his forces were taking a stand on Henry Hill in the heat of the battle. South Carolina officer Bernard B. at one point pointed to the Virginians and yelled to his men, there stands Jackson like a stone wall. Rally on the Virginians. And it's debated whether B meant that positively or negatively. If it was negatively, he may have meant that Jackson was standing still like a wall. He needed to move. But most historians, and the way the story is told, at least at the, the battlefield of Manassas today, is that B meant it meant that Jackson was standing solid, fierce, like a stone wall, unmovable, ready to attack. We'll really never know exactly what B meant because shortly after he said those words, a bullet ripped through his body and he was killed instantly. So most take it as a positive statement about Jackson and hence he received the name Stonewall Jackson. And that's the name he's most familiar with and at the battlefield park in Manassas there is a monument as you see on the screen to Jackson sitting erect with his horse standing like a stone wall the battle began on Henry's Hill it gravitated I should sorry Matthew's Hill then it gravitated to Henry Hill another event took place at the top of Henry's Hill is the home this is the rebuilt version of Judith Carter Henry's home. You see in the background there to the bottom right, the visitor center. I encourage you, if you ever are, are close to Manassas, Virginia, if you go visit Washington, it's not too far from there, to visit this battlefield. It's important to us as Adventists because of what happened there, and go and visit the battlefield. It is a really great place to visit. In fact, I encourage all of us to visit battlefields whenever possible. They are national parks in the United States, and that's a part of our history. Not only as Americans, but as Adventists because of the experience of our pioneers in birthing Seventh-day Adventism during the heat of the Civil War. But Judith Carter Henry was a widow. She was in her home, in her bedroom, and they were, the Union was sending shells. And one of them went through the house, landed in her bedroom, and filled her body with splinters. And several hours later, she died. The Civil War was fought in the front yards and backyards of Americans. And it began right here in this first battle. That is one unique aspect to the Civil War. It was fought on our own soil and our own backyard, literally. And her son, after the, he had seen his wounded mother before she died, he went outside and clung to the ground and cried out, they've killed my mother, they've killed my mother. It was a terrible scene. Here's a picture of the home on the left, a drawing of what it looked like after the battle. And then a year later, you can see on the right, it was totally destroyed. Soldiers would occupy it, and there was another battle there, the second battle of Manassas. And so there wasn't much left after all of that. Another interesting feature of this first battle is the rebel yell. This is when it first was first introduced by the rebels. Now, both sides had chanting, and I understand our military forces have chanting going into battle some today but the Union soldiers chanted as they went into battle theirs was a, a more disciplined type of chant as they went marched into battle they would huzza, 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 all of the forces at the, the, the soldiers at once as they went into battle the, the rebels yelled as they charged into battle but it was a much more high-pitch sound to it and it really terrified the Union. One Union soldier described it thus. 
There is nothing like it, speaking of the rebel yell, on this side of the infernal region. The particular corkscrew sensation that it sends down your backbone under these circumstances can never be told. You have to feel it. Now, the rebel yell is relevant to what I'm going to discuss here in a little bit. But I was searching the web not too long ago, Googling for something on the Civil War, and I came across a video. Now, do you realize that up until 1940, Civil War soldiers were still alive? Just like today, we still have World War II veterans up in their 80s now. Well, in the early part of the 20th century, you had Civil War veterans still alive, way up in years, up in their 80s. And I saw a video of Confederate, old Confederate soldiers giving the rebel yell. I heard the rebel yell. You can Google it. Google rebel yell and search and you'll find this video. And these guys were demonstrating the rebel yell. And I've read about this for years and wondered what it was like. And I can't believe it. I heard it. Would you like to hear it? I don't know if I better do it as loud as they did it. Now, the, these men were old men that I heard, so they didn't have full lung power. But I did hear them all do it at once. And let me tell you, I can imagine with thousands, thousands of soldiers giving that yell at once, it had to make your blood curdle. But this is how I heard them do it. I'm going to cover this so it's not too loud, and I'm not going to scream to the top of my lungs. You! 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 Imagine... 10,000 men, or groups of 6,000, shouting like that, that high-pitched scream. It's no small wonder the Union force was taken back when they first heard it. That's the rebel yell, and that's relevant to our discussion this morning because it is one of the theories that caused the Union troops to retreat so quickly, but we'll discuss that in a moment. Now, let me come to the heat of the battle. Now, on the screen, I have a picture from one of the pamphlets you get at the visitor center at the Manassas battlefield today. I took a picture of it because I think it captures the, the heat of the battle. This was at 4 p.m. That was the last beginning of the last hour of the battle. Let me point out a few things on there, and I'm not able to use my laser because I'm not in front of the screen, but, so I'll just describe it for you. To the left, you'll see the visitor center today. You see all the trees there? Those trees did not exist. They were not there in July of 1861. It was an open field. Now you'll see in the center bottom the Henry House. I just described that a moment ago. That, and beneath it is Henry Hill. To the left you see Ricketts Battery. That's a series of cannons. That would, was very significant in the battle as well. You see the red line. It says the new Confederate line at 4 p.m. That's Much of that is led by Jackson's Brigade as they are, they are advancing towards the Union. You see the blue bars there with the arrows pointing behind them. That is the Union force advancing against the Confederate line. And back on Chin Ridge, which didn't have the, all the trees on it, there were some trees, but not the forest you see there now. You see the Chin House site in the back, and then to the far left you see the uh, reddish-orange bars. Those were Confederate reinforcements. They had decided to make a major left flanking maneuver there. So they were setting up those reinforcements to flank. And the Union and advance in those bars there, that represents thousands of Union soldiers. We're talking, this was massive here, all right? These massive forces were, were clashing with one another. And then you see Howard's division in the back there, uh, in the backward part of Chin Ridge, who they were also attempting to flank. And you see the Union infantry to the far right of the screen, so you had flanking maneuvers going on. But this was at the height of the battle. A lot of fighting had already taken place. Ricketts battery, that is the, the cannons, that those went back and forth. The Confederates owned it at once. Then the, then the Union took it back. Then the Confederates took it back. The battle went back and forth throughout the day. Remember, this started like at 6 a.m. in the morning. It's reached its climax here at 4 p.m. So you have this massive gray line advancing towards the Union. The Union forces, the massive Union forces coming back at them. And according to the story most often told, this is when the rebel yell came into play. And as a result of these Confederate forces advancing, the Union turned 
the Union soldiers began to retreat. You'll see the arrows pointing back. That's showing the retreat. They went back toward the Manassas Sudley Road you see there, and to the right of the screen, they went back and ran back towards Washington. They retreated all the way back to Washington. It was a sad day. Now, that's the battle in a nutshell. Now, let me tell you something else that was a planned strategy, and this is important for what we're going to get to here, of the Confederates. They had planned, I'd mentioned those forces there in the left, upper left of the screen. They were, and remember the trees weren't there. You had Stuart's Cavalry. You had several other divisions. They were planning a major flanking maneuver. They were going to come up by the Chin Ridge House and hit as the Union was advancing on that Confederate line. You see, the strategy was to hit them head on so they, you'd have a head-on battle, but while their attention is focused on the soldiers in front of them, they would flank them. That was a typical strategy. And that's what they had planned to do here. And they were going to come and hit the Union from the left and behind and destroy them. But it never happened. Those arrows on the screen never happened. That was the plan, the projected strategy, but it never happened because the Union soldiers retreated. And the retreat happened so fast, you read in the records, and they're all online, many books, the records of officers, both Union and Confederate, describing this event and the entire battle. The Confederates were confounded when the Union suddenly retreated. They didn't really know what to do, and they didn't pursue them. They didn't pursue them. They could have taken them. Won the battle had they pursued them, but they didn't. They just, they were amazed that you read the record and say, what happened here? And they just weren't in a position to really go after them. So that's the battle in a nutshell. The retreat has received a lot of attention. Here's an artwork of the retreat. I'll say more about the retreat in a minute, but let me just tell you what had happened. Remember, Washington thought this would be a short, easy battle. In fact, the soldiers were marching, the Union soldiers marched there all night long, and they were exhausted, but they were confident. This will be an easy battle. We will take them, oh rebels, really easy. And the civilians believed that as well, so much so that several miles, miles from the battlefield, you had congressmen, you had families, civilians, sitting on the hills with picnic baskets and children playing to watch the battle. They believed it was going to be that easy of a battle and the Confederates would lose that quickly. They brought their families and picnic baskets to watch the battle. Well, things certainly didn't go as they thought. And they suddenly saw all these Union soldiers panickingly running towards them. And they all mingled together on the road back to Washington. It was a disaster. And many lives were lost then when these civilians mingled with these soldiers. It was a stampede. I'll say more about that later on. But that's the battle in a nutshell. Now, let me share with you my experience of going to the 150 year anniversary. Remember, this is the sesquicentennial of the Civil War, these four years now, 2011 to 2015, the 150 year anniversary celebration of the Civil War. In just a few short weeks, you'll have the 150 year anniversary at Gettysburg. And uh, I don't know how I would advise anybody to go there now because it will be crowded. Gettysburg is a huge place, but you want to go to Gettys Gettysburg sometime in the future. I'm going to say more about that tomorrow. That, that park today is, is just an unforgettable experience, but so is Manassas. And so I was there, and it was a huge celebration. They had military forces there. They had all the reenactors. Have you heard about Civil War reenactors? Let me tell you something. These guys, if you've never experienced them, this is my first time. I've just gotten into the Civil War over the last couple of years. These guys are real. They take it seriously. You had hundreds of reenactment Confederate soldiers there and Union soldiers there. And they had a major reenactment of the battle. And I was there the whole day. I was so excited, I didn't even eat. I mean, I just ex took everything in, flashing pictures with my camera. Here's part of the reenactment. And this gives you a sense of what it was like. These guys have simulated the weaponry and the dress and everything, and they've got it down to a T, and it is serious for them and I'm thankful for them sometimes you might if you're not familiar with that you look at, look at that and think why do these people invest so much time in that I remember thinking that years ago but now I see their great value 
they, they make history come alive. They make the Civil War come alive. And that's what they did here for me and others as we sit on the stand and watch this take place. Now you see all the smoke from the musketry fire? That's how it really was in Civil War battles. The smoke was thick and sometimes you couldn't see 10 feet ahead of you. That's why in this first battle, as you read the accounts, there was lots of confusion. As they fired the musketry, muskets, you see the, the smoke taking place and this massive battle on the field. It was just a lot of fun. They had the Confederate camp and the Union camp, and you were able to walk through there and take pictures. Here's the Union camp. This is exactly how it was, at least as much as they can get from history. Uh, what it was like to be a soldier and experience the camp. Here are Union soldiers, and what's interesting about the first battle of Manassas is that you see the different colored uniforms. They didn't get become all blue until later, and they learned from this first battle many of the troops were confused because of you, the Union had different colors. When they were in battle and they were, had soldiers coming at them, they weren't sure who was the enemy and who was the friend. Uh, it, it, was, it was quite confusing because of the different uniforms, but I snapped these pictures they, as they were forming lines. They take this very seriously, and you, you find a group, and these guys were just standing around visiting. I lifted my camera. They go into to picture format. Uh, they, go, they model for you, and there's a, a guy playing Grant sit, sitting down, as you can see there. And uh, it was just a lot of fun, and it was really something and, he, and they also ate like Civil War soldiers ate. Get a load of this. How would you like to eat that for breakfast? That's quite in quite a contrast to Steve Warburg's discussion this morning about juicing. <laughs> That's all they had. And let me tell you something. These guys ate this. They were cooking it, and I watched them eat it. I had to pretend it was curled striples so I could stomach it. That was pork. In fact, they, uh, I learned that they took they would, for all the soldiers, they would slaughter hundreds and hundreds of hogs and give chunks of it to the soldiers and they'd put it in their bag and go off to battle like that. And over days, it would, it would sour and was full of maggots and they would just scrape the maggots off and they would cook it. And that's what you see there. And that's what Civil War soldiers ate very often. They had all their other food. They had tack, which were these cracker crackers that they ate and it was just fascinating to see that and uh, this this individual was sewing his pants just like an actual Civil War soldier would do so if you ever get a chance to view one of these reenactments I encourage you to to go there and, and experience what it was like in the 1860s during the Civil War now let's go to the vision itself let's set the background for it two days after the Battle of Bull Run or Manassas James and Ellen White left Michigan on a tour and reached Roosevelt, New York, where on August 3, she experienced a vision. She's in Roosevelt, New York. I was there last year. That is a historic Adventist site. Her insights gave courage to these church members about the stability of the Union and its armies, and they needed that. This vision was timely because the Adventist shared quite fully in the common despair of the North. Because the Battle of Manassas was a disaster, the retreat of the Union soldiers, it was basically a Confederate victory. Barely, but it nevertheless was considered a Confederate victory. Confederate rhetoric made it much more of a victory than it was, but it nevertheless was a victory. And in fact, as those soldiers ran all night retreating, those Union soldiers, it rained that night. They it came back into Washington the next morning. These guys didn't stop. They were so terrified until they got back to Washington. And they have pictures of these troops coming back in covered in mud. It was a depressing day for Lincoln, his administration, for the North. And their great fear was, guess what? An invasion of the Confederates to Washington. They braced themselves, but it did not happen. It could have happened if the Confederates perhaps had regrouped themselves, but in many ways they really weren't in a position to do that and then it rained it's very interesting as you study the Civil War you read about the rain that occurred after major battles because when it rained they could go nowhere you take those those buggies and those massive armies in fact there are stories of soldiers who would walk in waist-deep mud 
and it slowed them down. And so you really couldn't maneuver in mud when it rained, and so the Confederacy, Confederacy could not assault an attack on Washington because of the rain and other reasons as well. But that was their fear, and so there's a lot of discouragement. They thought it would be a decisive victory. Their ego was inflated. But now, this was a great loss. And so there was a lot of discouragement in the North. And Adventists, of course, who felt the war would help put down slavery, were discouraged as well. So the vision came at a very appropriate time. It was first printed in the Review, August 27, 1861. So this is within a week after the Battle of Manassas. And later published in Testimonies, Volume 1. Often Ellen White would take weeks to write out her visions. In this case, she did it quickly. She wanted this message to get out. Here is what she wrote, and it's a much more lengthy portion than this if you read it in Testimonies. I'm going to actually, going to actually talk about other parts of it tomorrow, but I want to just get to the scene dealing with the retreat. Now, let me tell you before I get into this, this is an interpretation of this event and the whole Civil War. There are many interpretations of the war by historians. There are many interpretations of this retreat by the Union soldiers. This is one interpretation. This is Ellen White's interpretation. Obviously, it's the one that I espouse because of my convictions about her prophetic ministry, but also what I'm about to share with you as I study the battle itself. It really makes better sense than any other interpretation. But I want to say that there are other interpretations. I listened as I was there, 150, not, I almost said 150 years ago, at the 150-year celebration. I, they had all the rangers that ever worked at Manassas. And so they had one tour after another as they related the details of the battle. Guess who was on most of those tours? Taking it all in, listening to their perspective. And after they would give their spiel, it was a Q&A time, I asked questions. And I was not trying to stump these guys. I respect them. They're very knowledgeable. But, and of course, they were looking at it from a total human perspective, from a horizontal perspective. I had more vertical perspective, okay? And I asked a few questions about, because they all said it was a slow retreat, and it was because of the rebel yell. And I, and I asked them about certain records by the officers about a sudden, instantaneous retreat. And some of them had never thought of that before, and they cocked their heads. And, hmm. and I wasn't trying to stump them. I was very respectful. And I didn't say a word about an angel. Okay? It was not appropriate to do that. I would have lost all credibility. So I didn't say anything about that. I just asked as intelligent questions as I could, trying to get as much information from their perspective as I could for my own purposes. And it was very helpful. But I respect these rangers. They do have a lot of knowledge. But I have a different interpretation of the same events. So here is Ellen White's view of this battle. I had a view of the late disastrous battle at Manassas, Virginia. It was the most exciting, thrilling, distressing scene. The Southern Army had everything in their favor and were prepared for a dreadful contest. The northern army was moving on with triumph, not doubting but that they would be victorious. Many were reckless and marched toward boastingly as though victory were already theirs. And that is a fact, as I shared with you earlier. As they neared the battlefield, many were almost fainting through weariness and want of refreshment. Remember, it was hot. These troops had been marching through the night. Both the Confederate side and the northern side, the, the federal side, they were already exhausted at the beginning of the battle and early in the morning they were very thirsty they rushed into battle and fought bravely but desperately let me share with you in the next slide an eyewitness testimony of a confederate colonel who describes the thirst that reflected how all the soldiers felt in the heat of the battle he was a part of Stuart's cavalry and he was a part of the charge on the Union and then he writes, or he reflected on the battle years later and wrote, I found myself almost perishing from thirst, from intense heat and the violence of my exertions during the charge. It seemed that water I must have or die. And Comet, that was his horse, was suffering as much as his master. In rear of the enemy, there was a small branch, uh, that is, of water. And to this I determined to venture. Uh, this gives us a picture of the battle scene, okay, and the aftermath. Its banks were lined with the enemy, wounded, who had crawled there to drink, 
and many had died with their heads in the water. The dark blood flowing into and gradually mingling with the stream. And as he goes on in the narration, he describes, he took his horse and they tried to find places in the water where there wasn't blood. And even in the places where he drank, where the water was clear, he said it had a peculiar taste to it. In fact, if you read the testimonies of the soldiers, and I'll give you some of those testimonies tomorrow, they say that after the battlefield, when they would walk through all the dead piled upon each other, there was a certain smell. It was a smell of blood, and they say they all became accustomed to it, and they, it was the same smell after every battle. So that gives you a sense of how bloody the Civil War was. And I'm going to share some graphic testimonies tomorrow because that will verify some of Ellen White's statements about the casualties in the war. But back to this battle here. She continues in her vision. The dead and dying were on every side. Both the north and the south suffered severely. The southern men felt the battle and in a little would have been driven back still further. See, she's making general stroke statements because she just saw this. She didn't know the details and the flanking maneuvers and all of that. She's just describing what she had seen. Northern men were rushing on, although their destruction was very great. Just then an angel descended and waved his hand backward. Here's the event. The angel descended and waved his hand backward. Instantly, there was confusion in their ranks. It appeared to the northern men that their armies were retreating when it was not in reality so, and a participant retreat commenced. It seemed wonderful to me, and by wonderful she means amazing, incredible, and precipitate. It, it was fast. It happened in rapid succession. So there's the depiction of the angel coming down. Now, this retreat has various interpretations. Let me summarize them for you. One, and this, this is years later, the records of the officers and the stories told about the, the battle and its climax and the retreat was by blunders of the soldiers and officers. But that was too generic and one that has held on more longer and the one I heard the most when I was at Manassas by the various rangers is this. The rebel yell we discussed earlier broke Yankee nerve and ranks. And in addition to that, Confederate reinforcements arriving on the field, because that advance was quite a massive one there at 4 p.m. that we I showed you on the screen earlier. And so that's the most popular version. If you go to the Manassas battlefield and go on a ranger tour, and do that. It's interesting. Just don't tell them about the angel. Without the background, that is. But the story you will hear is the rebel yell and Confederate reinforcements and various flanking maneuvers. That's what caused the soldiers to retreat. And they say it began slowly. They also argue that the Union soldiers were confused because the different uniforms confused them as well. Their own, they thought maybe their own were retreating and so forth. And so those are the stories that you hear. Another version is the loss of Ricketts' guns. Remember I shared how there was, they went back and forth on both sides who claiming Ricketts' guns, his cannons. It went back and forth, and finally the Confederates seized the cannons, and, and the Union saw that. They lost heart, and they retreated. That's not really a popular version as two and three, though. And finally, a version that was around but lo was lost sight of in the early 20th century was that the retreat occurred in an instant in a manner unaccountable to human faculties. They said nothing about an angel, but the one who believed that version was Winfred Scott, the great military genius. He was not at the battle, but as he interviewed the soldiers and officers about what happened, that's the conclusion he came to. We can't describe this retreat. It was an instantaneous retreat, and there's no way to describe it in human terms. It just happened that way. Well, that you won't hear that today uh, by the rangers and historians of, of every historian of the Battle of Manassas. I've not heard anything about this instantaneous retreat, but it is documented. It was around, and it best harmonizes with Ellen White's version. There is one credible eyewitness account, though, that affirms the last interpretation, and it's one that was published in the mid-20th century. 
and lost sight of up to that point. Colonel William Blackford, who I just cited a moment ago, he was of Stewart's Calvary. The, his account was published by historian Douglas S. Freeman, who found Blackford's manuscript while researching for his book, Lee's Lieutenants. Blackford really wrote his account out. He evidently took, made a diary after each battle, and then years later his family urged him to write it out for heritage purposes. And so he wrote it out for his family, and then the manuscript was found by this historian. The manuscript reflects the accuracy and detail of all who must have written with wartime diaries in front of him. With Freeman's editing, War Years with Jeb Stewart was subsequently published in 1945, and I have my own copy of that book. And he describes, Blackford describes this retreat. I want to share with you what he says. He describes that in the stream of Stewart's Calvary, and I'll show you this on the screen in a moment, he emerged on Chin Ridge, which now has trees, but at that time there were no trees. He emerged on top, as he said, of the battle cyclorama. He was in a position where he could see the entire battle scene taking place before him. He observed the stormy battle scenes taking place. Now, you see the screen below. That's what's from the pamphlet that you get from the visitor center today. But it, it, it is helpful in many ways, and so I use it here. Listen to Blackford's description. So he arrives on Chin Ridge. You see Chin Ridge up there? If you look at Henry House, kind of veer to your left a little bit, you'll see Chin Ridge in the back. I'm going to show you now, illustrate for you, Blackford's line of vision. And this has been researched by a scholar years ago. It's a master's thesis. I cited it yesterday. I'll cite it again here in a moment. Lee Usley. And he has done a lot of preliminary research. I am building on his research and finding it very helpful. But he pinpointed, and I think rightly so, because I was at this battlefield, as I told you, and I, was, I scoured every inch of this thing trying to determine all of this. And you see the circle and the arrows. That represents Blackford's position, the big dot, and the arrows represent his line of vision, everything he could see. So the Union forces attacking the Confederates and the Confederates advancing towards the Union, that clash, he could see that with great clarity from his vantage point up on the hill of Chin Ridge. Now remember, the trees were not there, so his vision was clear. So let's read his account. It was now about four o'clock, and the battle raged with unbated fury. The lines of blue were unbroken. You see the bars there? And at this point, the arrow pointing backwards, they hadn't started retreating yet. They were very organized and disciplined. And huzza, huzza, huzza advancing on the Confederates with their rebel yell. The lines of blue were unbroken and their fire as vigorous as ever while they surged against the solid walls of gray, standing immovable in their front. You see that big red line? That's the solid walls of gray. And again, the blue is the Union forces. But now the most extraordinary spectacle I have ever witnessed took place. I had been gazing at the numerous well-formed lines as they moved forward to the attack, some 15 or 20,000 strong in view. So those three blue bars, that represents about 15 or 20,000. This was a massive battle here. So some 15 or 20,000 strong in view. And for some reason, had turned my head in another direction for a moment. When someone exclaimed, pointing to the battlefield, Look! Look! I looked, now see his line of vision there, see the arrows? I looked, and what a change had taken place in an instant, where those well-dressed, well-defined lines with clear spaces between had been steadily pressing forward. The whole field was a confused swarm of men, like bees, running away as fast as their legs could carry them, with all order and organization abandoned. In a moment more, the whole valley was filled with them as far as the eye could reach. Now there's an eyewitness testimony with no bias, simply describing what he saw. He really wrote this for his family. And of course, was later published in 1945. An Adventist who read this said, Wow, that harmonizes with Ellen White's 
perspective with precision. You see, found this in his research, and then he wrote about this, thus the panic which touched off the retreat. He gives a very good description here and interpretation. Thus the panic which touched off the retreat to the Potomac was accounted for by White, but graphically detailed by Blackford. She spied the backward wave of the angelic hand. He sensed the electric effect of it. She proceeded to read into the disaster salvation from greater destruction. He soon felt bitterly disappointed because the Confederate leaders failed to exploit their victory. Remember, they did not pursue the retreating Confederates or Union soldiers. And that's why I don't think the theory that the rebel yell scared them away works because if it, if it really did work, then they would have pursued them. I mean, if, if they, it wouldn't have been such an instantaneous retreat and they would have pursued them. So there are numerous reasons why that really doesn't make sense. Ellen White's perspective makes the most sense here. And of course, an obvious motivation for me is verification of Ellen White's prophetic gift. But I'm trying to listen to the facts, to the history, and I see perfect harmony here. Here's a picture I found in the visitor center in the museum that they have there, which is well worth going through. Here's a picture by a painter of what the battlefield looked like early on in the battle. This is before it really intensified in Henry Hill. You see the house at the top there? That's Henry Hill. But this is from Chin Ridge without the trees. So this, this is a picture of, of how the battlefield looked without all of those trees. And Blackford was more to the right up on the higher ridge looking down. You see that vast open field there beneath the house. At the height of the battle, that was when it was filled with all the soldiers. And that gives you a sense of what Blackford was able to see in the battlefield. Now, I was interested myself in, as far as possible, determining the approximate, if not the precise location, where this angel came down. Just a personal interest of mine. So, of course, I went all over the battlefield, and I theorized it may have been on Chin Ridge because... There was a major retreat, a sudden breakup of Howard's division, you see there, and a retreat. But, and some Adventists believe that, that I talked to one anyway. But the timing doesn't really fit, the chronology of the events. Because clearly the retreat had already taken place. And in fact, that division up there on Chin Ridge describes how fearful the troops were as they were in line, ready for battle, watching these fearful Union soldiers retreat past them. And that didn't help their morale. And then when they were confronted with the Confederate force, they turned and retreated as well. So it had to have happened on Henry Hill. That's the beginning of this instantaneous retreat. You see the arrow to the left? You see Confederate reinforcements, the arrow to the left? I was right at the end of that arrow. And I took this picture from the side of the battlefield. And you see straight ahead Ricketts' guns. The cannons, look to the left, and you'll see the tall tree. Then you see the small tree. I think it took place the heart of the battle and where the angel came down right in that approximate location. Here's from another vantage point. I'm standing in front of Ricketts' guns, and I'm pointing to the approximate location where I believe the angel descended. Now, is that really that important? No, it's, what's important is that it happened. But that's just for my personal interest, and I thought you might be interested in that too. I probably won't put this in the book <laughs> uh, that I'm writing now on this whole thing. But uh, I, I thought it was exciting when I finally determined this is where it happened. This is where a divine intervention occurred. That was just a little faith-building thing for me. That may or may not be important to you. I have nothing to urge there. The retreat. The point is that it, is that it happened. The stampede from Bull Run. Here's an art piece of artwork about that retreat after they had left the battlefield and were running and they mingled with all the visitors and civilians and even congressmen were there on the battlefield. One congressman was arrested by Confederates and taken to a pris prisoner and brought to Richmond. Here's an eyewitness description of the retreat and it gives you a sense of the panic-stricken soldiers which affected the other crowd, the rest of the crowd. At half past five, remember it happened at four and 
by 5, they're all retreating now, 5 o'clock in the afternoon. By 5, the federal troops were in full retreat, pursued at different points by a black horse cavalry of Virginia. There was some pursuit, but it never was really followed through. Retreat is a weak term to use when speaking of this disgraceful rout. The terror-stricken soldiers threw away their arms and accoutrements, herding along like a panic-stricken flock of sheep, with no order whatever in their flight. Wounded men were crushed under the wheels of the heavy, lumbering chariots that dashed down the road at full speed. Light buggies containing members of Congress were overturned or dashed to pieces in the horrible confusion of the panic. And so this was not a good experience. And so a lot of people, including civilians and soldiers, lost their lives in the stampede to get away from the battle. And of course they were all saying, the Confederates are upon us. And so they were terror filled and that filled the civilians with terror. And of course the Union soldiers that had seen that whatever it was that terrified them, you know, we would believe that it was an angelic manifestation, but they didn't know what it was. It just terrified them. And they, were, they ran literally all night long. They did not stop until they got to Washington that next morning. Let me continue with the, the vision, a few more points. And this is a significant statement, she said, right after describing the, dis, the angel. Then it was explained that God had this nation in his own hand. I find that to be an encouraging statement, not only to the people back then, the Adventists back then, but to us today. More on that in a little bit. That God had this nation in his own hand and would suffer no victories to be gained faster than he ordained and no more losses to the northern men than his, in his wisdom he saw fit to punish the north for their sin. This is a pattern right here, this statement that worked itself out in various battles of the Civil War. And I'm going to unpack the results or, if you will, the fulfillment of this statement tomorrow morning. But let me move on here. Now, you remember the projected Confederate flank illustrated there by the bright red arrows on the screen? Come by the Chin House site and assault from the left flank and from behind the Union as they are, were preoccupied with the Confederates in front of them. It never happened because the Union retreated. But had they not retreated, they would have been flanked by this massive force to their left and behind them. And it would have been a disaster. Listen to this next statement by Ellen White. And in this battle, had the North Northern army pushed the battle still further, had they not retreated, that is, in their fainting, exhausted condition, a far greater struggle and destruction awaited them, which would have caused great triumph in the South. Now, you never hear this story told because it didn't happen. Those bright arrows there on the screen are the projected path of the Confederate flanking. It never happened because they stopped. They never executed the plan because the Union retreated. And as I said earlier, you read the records of the officers and they said the, the Yankees escaped. They ran scared and they got away. But had they continued, they would have been flanked and destroyed and the Confederate victory would have been complete. I find that interesting. Nobody knew what was going to happen, but here we have Ellen White's profound insight into what could have happened had God not intervened. Now listen to the next statement. God would not permit this and send an angel to interfere. The sudden falling back of the northern troops was a mystery to all, and it was initially. How did this happen? Why did this happen? They knew not that God's hand was in the matter. Remember Winfield Scott? He said there had to have been an instantaneous retreat, but we can't account for it. It was a mystery to all, but they knew not that God's hand was in the matter. And here Adventists were given this unique, divine insight into God's intervention in this first battle of Manassas. Bull run. Let's summarize Ellen White's insight now. 
In general, the North regarded the affair as a disaster, and the people had folded their hands in despair. That was the prevailing attitude. But Ellen White saw this event as a blessing in disguise. A blessing that the troops had retreated. In the retreat, God was sparing the northern army of a terrible defeat as well as punishing them. We'll say more about this tomorrow when we discuss the Emancipation Proclamation to free the slaves. For the North and for Lincoln, the war did not begin to free the slaves. That would come later. It was transformed into a war to free the slaves. Now, the succession, as I mentioned, began because of slavery. But the Union, while it had slavery in mind, its main reason was to, Lincoln's reason was to protect the integrity of the Union. And succession was against that. Therefore, he had to declare war. Or at least respond when the Confederates bombed Fort Sumter, which he was hoping would happen. At least in terms of finally engaging in battle. So, pulling it all together here, God intervened in the initial battle of the Civil War. Was that the only time that an angel was involved in the Civil War? Ellen White says nothing about any more angelic involvement in the battlefields. But I would suggest, as she pulled back the curtain for us and were able to see divine intervention, because of other things that she said about God's work in this war and punishing the North and the South because of the slavery issue, I suggest there were probably more angels involved in these battles than we'll ever know. In fact, angelic involvement has probably been involved in many battles. World War I, World War II, the war against terrorism. What are some assurances we can draw for this, from this event as I bring it to a close now? First of all, her statement, God has this nation in his hands. What an assurance. For those people, those Adventists, they knew now that the North would achieve ultimate victory. It didn't look like it after the Battle of Manassas and at various points over the years in the, the war. There were some low points for the North. But the North would eventually prevail. What assurance that was for them. And I want to tell you, that I think is assurance for us. Today, I would assert God has America in His hands. She's not spoken like a dragon yet. This is the greatest country on the world today. It may have its faults, but God has His hand in this nation. And as we look at things transpiring around us today from terrorism to the IRS and all of these things, listen, God has this nation in His hands. And the work of God can go forward in that context. Now let me tell you something. Earlier in the week, a few came up and shared some conspiracy theories with me. Lincoln's involvement, the Jesuits, and so forth. And, and I, what I'm about to say, I am not speaking to those individuals because I thought they were balanced in what they shared uh, about the conspiracy theories, but let me just say, I, I've encountered lots of conspiracy theories in my work about the United States, 911, and so forth, and I meet people that are obsessed with conspiracy theories, and I think we can become very unbalanced about conspiracy theories and get too caught up in them. I don't think we need to worry so much about all these conspiracy theories, because God has this nation in His hands. So we need to be careful. In fact, if, if you are, and I'm speaking generically here, if, if you are so caught up in conspiracy theories that they give you a, that you get your spiritual high from learning about conspiracy theories, I would assert something's wrong. Something's wrong. Our spiritual high should be engaging with the Word of God and communion with the Holy Spirit and praying to Jesus and witnessing for Him. Again, I'm not saying we should ignore conspiracy theories. I'm not throwing them all out the window. 
I'm just saying we need to be balanced and not get too caught up in conspiracy theories. But here's conspiracy theories. Here's the point. When I hear about these conspiracy theories, I don't really worry about America and 911 and Jesuits and all of this. God has this nation in his hands. I don't need to worry about conspiracy theories. He'll work everything out. And if there's a conspiracy theory that I really need to know about, he will let me know. God has this nation in his hands. And another assurance, and I already made this point earlier, there was more angelic involvement in the Civil War than just Bull Run. God was involved. In the, he is involved in the affairs of this world and very involved even on the battlefield from the Civil War to the War on Terrorism. There's more angelic involvement in our lives than we realize. Let me bring this home personally. We talked about an angel today, an angelic intervention. Let's bring this home personally. Do you believe in angels? Do you believe that you have a guardian angel? Do you believe that angel is active in your life? Have you ever seen that angel? If you have, don't raise your hand. but they're very active. Let me close with this statement by Ellen White about angels. Heaven and earth are no wider apart today than when shepherds listen to the angel's song. Humanity is still as much the object of heaven's solicitude as when common men of common occupations met angels at noonday and talked with the heavenly messengers in the vineyards and the fields. To us, in the common walks of life, heaven may be very near. Angels from the courts above will attend the steps of those who come and go at God's command. I find the assurance of protecting angels to be a great blessing. And I have no idea, and I'll bet you have no idea, how much they have been involved in our lives over the years and perhaps prevented us from future disasters, just as the angel prevented the Union troops from great disaster at Bull Run. God is at work in the world. He's at work in this nation. He's at work in your life and my life. Amen? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we want to thank you for the promise of heavenly angels that are very engaged with the affairs of this world and even our individual lives. We thank you for that blessing. We thank you that the gift of prophecy through Ellen White can be verified by studying the details of history. From the battles of the Civil War to the nature of 19th century America. Thank you for these insights. Bless us as we continue to study the next two mornings on these issues and guide us each the rest of this day, I pray. In Jesus' name, amen. <laughs> Thank you.